But I welcome you. Good morning again. If you have your copy of God's Word, would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and we're verses 6 through 10. So we discover the comforting church. And of course, we're talking about the church local. There's a phrase that is used often, thoughts and prayers. It's something of a filler phrase that's used in secular society. When someone feels compelled to say something caring, but they're empty words to the secular world, thoughts and prayers, you're thinking about us, you're praying to what? But for us, it's different. For us, it's completely different because we're the ones who can say that. We're Christians, the world stole that from us. They feel like, well, I got to feel some, say something spiritual. We say something spiritual because it actually has meaning. So for us, thinking about one another fondly and the love of Christ, it runs far deeper than mere words can express. And the church in prayer for one another is a deep comfort to each member of the church. It's more than simply empty words said in a secular culture. The church thinking, the church praying for one another, it strengthens the bonds that we share, a special connection that is found only in Christ, where we are comforted and we are encouraged by one another. Have these things in mind as we approach this passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, And has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Let us go to the Father together. Oh Lord, how precious is your word to us. It is a treasure, for you have not left us in darkness and in ignorance, feeling about our way, wondering where we came from and who you are. But you perfectly reveal to us who you are. You expose to us who we are, our need of grace, and, O Lord, you supply that through Jesus Christ, whom we receive by faith. What joy there is. Bless us now, your church, a church in study of your everlasting word. We ask this, that you may be glorified, we may be encouraged and comforted by your mercy we find there in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember the context, Paul was torn away from this church in Thessalonica, and these baby Christians were on his heart but also found in his prayers often, as he has said. He kept planning to go see them face to face, but he said, every time I planned, Satan kept cutting off those plans. Paul just couldn't wait any longer. And so what does he do? He sent a brother and co-worker in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Timothy, to go check on them, to be an encouragement to them, but also to bring back a report on how things are going. Paul genuinely loved the people in the Thessalonian church. He didn't just say, you know, I love this church, and he just says it vaguely. He knows the faces. He knows the names. His emotions are wrapped up into how strong their faith in Jesus is and how they endured trials in love together. It goes back to how the last section ended. In verse 5, it says, For this reason... When I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. And here, get this, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. 
Paul feared that Satan would tempt this little church away from the faith, away from love, all because of affliction. And this ought to be our concern for one another. Paul sends Timothy, since he couldn't come face to face, and our concern is face to face. You know, in the world, when they say thoughts and prayers, they say it from a distance without any desire of actual fellowship. In fact, they say it as a filler word to avoid fellowship. Oh, not so for us. Our concern is face to face. He says, this is the reason that we are, are to be concerned for one another face to face is that we may serve and love one another by being actually together. But second best is sending Timothy. Right, second best is like, if I can't be there, I will send someone who can be a help to you. When Timothy gets back and he reports how well this little church was doing, Paul's heart explodes into thanksgiving to God, and his concern for them is relieved in the depths of his heart as he says, I'm encouraged by and through your faith. The great emotion which overflows from Paul's heart by this comforting church is joy. He says, I have joy. In fact, he goes so far as our life, our encouragement is your faith. How I am filled with thanksgiving, Paul says, and rejoice with joy before God because of you all, because of how well you are doing. And there are precious lessons to learn here about how to see the local church, how to see ourselves in the context of this local church, and Christ's mercies to each of us in and through the faith of the local church. So Paul needed to be comforted, which is why he could bear it no longer. There is an emotion there. I could not bear it anymore. Right? This was not simply cold rational. This is the depths of feeling. My heart could not bear it anymore, so I sent Timothy while we were left alone here in Athens. Here's Paul and Silas now having to take on the work that is far beyond even three men, but now is narrowed down to two. He himself has been afflicted, and the Thessalonian church has suffered afflictions, and the fear was that Satan would visit this little church in their afflictions and tempt them to abandon the faith or to fall into sin. Look at what comforts Paul. What is comforting to Paul despite his own afflictions? This church thinks about him, and they have faith and love. He's left Athens. He's likely in Corinth now, and he's just like, I, this is hard. My work is hard. Is it odd that your suffering seems less heavy? When you are cared for genuinely by the church, it doesn't mean that it just goes away. But it seems a less of a heaviness. Paul says that he's simply relieved. And it's all because this church thinks about him. That's all he says. He didn't send him money. <laughs> he doesn't send him anything. He just says, we sent Timothy back. We still believe your labor is not in vain. We still trust in the promises of God and Jesus Christ, and we love one another. The afflictions have not robbed us of the joy that is in Christ. And so his suffering, Paul, his grief, it seemed light now just because he had heard about their faith in Jesus and their love and that they think of him kindly. There is that connection we share as a church God has made us alive, and get this, together. That's what Paul told the Ephesian church. There is a togetherness that he is teaching them in this letter to Ephesus. There is something about that here in 1 Thessalonians. And that connection is seen here. Timothy has returned to us, he says, mid-letter, with good news. Your faith is unshaken by your suffering. And despite grief, you have not used that grief and hostility toward one another, you've taken your grief and it has fueled a love for one another. Satan may hinder the physical meeting, right? Paul has wanted to go, 
But this faith-fueled love of this local church frustrated every one of Satan's attempts to tempt them away from loving one another. And this church remembered Paul, and they remembered the team with fondness and equally longed to see them as they longed to see this little church. There was this mutual connection. We longed to see one another face to face. Faith-fueled love for one another as Christians gives two outcomes that I see in this passage. Look here at the end of verse 6. He says, remembering with kindness, right? Longing to see each other face to face. That's one outcome. When you are a genuinely loving Christian, I love Christ above all things. One outcome is I long to see the faces of the local church and I long to be with them face to face. Sweet memories looking back, joy and longing looking forward to seeing each other once again. He says, in all our distress, in all my affliction, Paul says, we are now comforted. Finally, relief has come. We now live, he says. There's kind of this feeling of dying inside. We have liveliness again. In all our distress and in all of our trouble, we are now renewed in strength, having heard of your faith and your love. Afflictions can visit any friendship. It can visit your marriage. And Satan seems to draw even nearer with a grip open upon, a grin upon his face when he sees you in grief. He's like, oh, they're grieving, they're suffering. Now's my time to come in. Now is a good opportunity to tempt you to be bitter, to go away from loving the church and hating them, to go away from trusting Christ. It's now time to distrust him. Don't remember Paul with kindness is what his words were to this church. Look at your affliction. Look how he left you. I don't care about what he used to do. It is now time to look upon him with disdain and contempt. Don't long to see him again. Tell him, don't come. Don't even bother. I don't want to see your face. Think bitterly because of your distress, because of your grief, because of your suffering. Jesus doesn't care about you anymore. His church doesn't even care about you anymore. It is time to abandon. Satan will bug you when you are troubled. He craves for you to look at other Christians without any kindness. He wants to keep Christ's church disjointed, meaning he would love more than anything for you to find excuses to hate fellowship with other Christians. He uses distress and he uses afflictions to keep you bitter and he uses your bitterness to enslave you to hatred. Beloved, I say this in the context of this. Weep with those who weep. There is a comfort in the unity of the Holy Spirit bonded in this church in simply weeping together. There are those who are in distress. There are those who are troubled in this church body. Think of them kindly. Think of their interests above your own. Serve them. Love them. Do you see the church as people where the Holy Spirit shapes your heart to love and to serve others? Is that how you see how you come here this morning? Did you pray before you came this morning? Lord, send me somebody that I may serve them. Send me somebody that I may encourage them. May they come to me needing encouragement. Or did you want to try to just slip through this? I don't want to obey anything Jesus commands of me today. I just want to get through all of this. Look again at verse 7. For this reason, brothers, and he gave us saying, my brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we've been comforted about you and through your faith. Paul says, my brothers. That's, that's in the depths of his heart. He doesn't look at this church and Psh, you people over there. His emotions are tied to them. They are my family. 
That's his heart. You are my family, my family in Christ, whom I long to see face to face, whom I remember always in my prayers, whom I always thank God for. You are my brothers. We exist by the grace of God in Christ Jesus as a local church to build one another up in the faith and in love. And obedience to this cheers Paul's heart. I think this means this church was visited by false teachers and they collectively ignored them. They're like, get away with that nonsense. Paul taught us we will stay faithful to the word of God. Yet there is also something more. We are called to live in community. And that means face-to-faceness, if I can coin a term. And it's more than a club with members. It's a family of the deepest sense, deeper than blood kinship. So when you think, I have a blood family, but there's something that I have been purchased by the blood of Christ into this much deeper sense, a true family, this is the reason. My brothers, Paul says, my heart longs for you deeply. It hurts to see you. It hurts not to see you. It hurts not to be with you. And yet, I am encouraged and made glad again when I hear from Timothy that you are faithful, you still love one another despite the trials, despite Satan. The tempter wants you to see the church and other Christians with constant contempt and suspicion. I hope that he's unsuccessful. He doesn't want to see faith. He does not want to see you obey Christ and love with kindness. He does not want to see Christ's commands obeyed in fellowship. He wants to see arm's length with one another. That keeps us from confessing sins to one another because, well, I don't want to feel safe around that. I don't want to be strengthened. No burden carrying. And when the church has faith and love that fills Paul's encouraged heart with thanksgiving... Paul says, I'm encouraged, I'm re-strengthened through your faith of this church. They still trusted Jesus. We live in the Lord because you stand firm in the Lord. You are not shaken by this affliction because you stand now. How does a church stand in the Lord? Remember, when Jesus told his disciples to consider how the Gentiles exercise authority, by lording over their subjects, right? So it is one of sheer dominion and you obey out of fear. That's it, right? This was Jesus requesting them. You know, remember John, James and John came, their mother actually, yeah, sit on my right hand and left hand when you enter your kingdom. Jesus was teaching about kingdom greatness. He says, this is not going to be among you. The way you see Gentiles rule, you're going to rule these apostles, but also any leadership that's pastors. You know, we we do lead by serving, by being the least, by being humble. Whoever is to be great must be a servant, lowly, for even the Son of Man came to serve and not be served. Jesus, the head of the church, sends servant leaders following him to love his church, that they may stand in the Lord. I, I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. It is uh, 2 Corinthians one twenty four. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. He says, uh, not that we lord it over your faith. And there's, there's the underlining. We, can't, we don't lord it just over you. We do not lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, and here's the, here's the connection. For you stand firm in your faith. Why, why did Paul teach the church in Thessalonica? Same reason he did in Corinth. You know, not to lord it over your faith, but to come alongside you to teach you that you may stand firm in the faith. So the apostle Paul told this church in Corinth, he led by being among them. And what for? For your joy. It wasn't motivated by his own. For your joy, for your sake, they stand firm in the Lord by faith alone. He didn't lead them by tyranny, 
by being demanding, but serving and teaching alongside them in their midst. All, all the good that we, the redeemed, could possibly enjoy is only found in the Lord. Good is not only from the Lord, good is in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. And there is where we withstand even the worst of heartaches here. You say, you say well, I don't know if I can withstand this heartache. Good, you can't. Unless you stand in the Lord. If you are managing through something right now, heartache, grief, suffering, affliction, you're like, I'm not handling this well. Stand firm in the Lord. And that's why we come to here, right? We're encouraged to stand firm in the Lord. And Paul hears this report. Well, that church is doing that. He says, you know what? My own affliction is now relieved because this church is standing firm in the Lord. I was dying. Now we live. This church is standing in the Lord and it encouraged Paul to continue on in his ministry, which is hard, read Acts, it's tough. But there is two fours that begin verses 8 and 9, and it ties to Paul's encouragement. Paul was encouraged, or you could say strengthened to carry on with joy because he heard the good news about this church and their faith. For, verse 8, Right? For now we live. Our liveliness is so wrapped up in your church and your standing in the Lord. To hear that you are standing in the Lord, we live. There's also 4, verse 9, and it ends with a question mark because Paul is being a bit creative here. What thanksgiving can we return to God for your church? He's not just saying what I get. See, what thanksgiving can I return to the Lord that my labor among you has produced this fruit, that you're faithful and you're loving to one another? Paul was incredibly thankful to God for this church which thought kindly of him and was faithful in the gospel of Jesus Christ that he preached to them that has produced a love for one another. And what joy we feel. I could almost preach a whole sermon on that. <laughs> Paul says, what joy we feel. Our hearts feel the depths of joy for the sake of the church before God. Paul had so many emotions when he thought about and prayed for this local church. Remember, he was filled with thanksgiving. He feared they fall into temptation during affliction. This church was his boast before God. That is an emotional explosion. Here now he feels joy regarding this church. And his joy, and don't miss this part, is in the presence of God. You realize you're in the presence of God when you pray, when you express joy. And that's where Paul is. When I heard the news from Timothy, my heart was to the depths of how I could feel with joy in the presence of God. It's not a momentary experience of joy, but a joy in the Lord in which this church stands. So Paul's heart for them was, did not surrender to flattery words. Remember, that's what he said in the previous chapter. It doesn't say, you know, I'm so emotionally wrapped up in this church that I led into pragmatism and started preaching nonsense, just flattering you. He says, no, it actually has fueled me to tell you more of the truth of the word of God. Because the more you grow, the more my joy is. The more your, your faith increases, the more my joy is. You know, the more afflictions come your way, and instead of becoming more hostile to one another, every affliction and every heartache has made it to where you love one another even deeper than yesterday. It brings joy to me, to the depths of how I feel. And this joy in the presence of God goes on. You can ask anybody in the world what brings you joy, and they're going to give you momentary tastes. What joy does a Christian have? We know that this heartache is not the end of me. It goes on in the presence of God forever. 
The emotion of concern for Paul remains in faithful shepherds today. And I can tell you this, I hate how Satan tempts you to abandon the preaching of the word of God. I hate it that Satan has entered pulpits throughout this American landscape to tempt you to abandon the word of God. And it usually comes in when things are not going well in your life. Look how things are not going well in your life. You don't need this. Here's some human reasoning and philosophy and cliches. Something that seems profound, but it'll scratch your itching ears for now. I hate how Satan troubles you. In fact, the more he troubles any member of this church, makes me angrier with him. And he, trouble, he meets a troubled soul who is lonely and traps them in bitter loneliness when Christ, our loving Savior, pours into us what we lack through face-to-face -face church. This is where it's supposed to be found. I hate how Satan troubles you. How are you to stand firm? How are you to repent of anger? How are you to repent of holding grudges or bitterness and find the actual comfort in Christ's comforting church? It's at this point we need reminding from the word of God. What has Christ done? What has he done that this is found in his church? What a gracious atonement Christ has made for me. And he made for this atonement for others in this church, his chosen people. That Christ would willingly suffer greatly for me, to die for me. He rose, proving we who were dead and her trespasses and sins are made alive together in Christ. In the Lord. Standing firm in the Lord. And for what purpose? To stand in the Lord together. To encourage one another in the faith. To love one another and glorify our Father in heaven. What joy we have in rejoicing in you, the church. That's what Paul said. I have joy in you. What thanksgiving could I return to God? For all the joy the church have filled my heart with rejoicing to God right now. Hearing this report. My thanksgiving would never be enough, is what Paul is saying, for my cup runs over because of you, the church. Paul asks a question that really cannot be answered. That's why there's a question mark at the end of 10. What thanksgiving could we return to God who, when he fills our hearts with such joyful rejoicing because of this church? We have joy. And we rejoice because of you all, the church. And where is our rejoicing? Before God. Because he's done it. He's done this work in you. Paul's joy and rejoicing before God was not individualistic. And it was not independent from others. That's the sad reality of so many sinners today. They're trying to find joy, even joy, divine joy. They say, well, I'm going to define joy in my own terms. I want it with God, but not in fellowship with God's people. I, I, want, it, I want it to be independent. And why? Because I, I, I do not want to repent of the sin that is anchoring me down and enslaving me to hatred. And Paul's like, you know what? I've heard good report and how my heart sings. It's a vulnerable heart. Paul's heart was vulnerable to deeply care about this church could have been a bad report. He had been devastated, especially in the middle of his affliction. But he was willing to send Timothy, troubled to think that they might be tempted in suffering and rejoicing with great joy when he hears that they're doing well. So this is wrapped up in verse 10, where he says, we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. I realize it's in the question, but it's also a statement. There is a need in this church in Thessalonica. Paul knew that they lacked, and Christ gifted him to supply what they lacked. 
spiritual growth of every Christian in the local church is fed by face-to-face supply. There is an investment in the life of a local church by every member. As we need one another and we thank God for one another, there are some things Jesus provides us which he only provides by handing to us through face-to-face church gatherings. In fact, you lack. You may not say that to yourself, oh, no, I don't know if I lack. Yes, you do. In fact, when you feel that and it tempts you, toward bitterness and attempts you toward anger and contempt toward other people. That is the emotional expression of what you lack. He says, you lack, I can supply it, and I can only do this face to face. But it is the mercy of Christ who is our supply. Can I tell you, it is humbling to admit to God that we need wisdom for what we go through day in and day out, and what is ahead in our lives. It is humiliating to admit to others our need for face-to-face fellowship and the preaching of the word of God for the wisdom that we lack. Can you, can you confess that now? That you lack wisdom. You do. Christ supplies wisdom. Pride will come by you. The tempter will say, surely Jesus would not supply to you what you lack through that person or through those people. Mm. Do you know what that is? Unforgiveness, pride, arrogance, and hatred. There are the temptations of the tempter that Paul feared would overcome this suffering Thessalonian church. You... You don't lack anything, says the tempter. In fact, all your problems are caused by other people. It's not internal, it's external. And I have found often in my own stubbornness that Christ supplies to me what I lack through people that I must learn to love. That I have to learn to forgive. People I must get over my bad self to love and to serve. And get this, and to be loved by. That's what Christianity is. I am sure to call me a friend requires some, a great deal of long-suffering. To, to, because I'm a sinner, and I know this. How good and lovely is our Savior to supply what we lack through people who require our spiritual maturity and an increase in love to be with Oh, to rejoice in sanctifying mercies to, and gain a brother and sister in love by our Savior's supply. Distress, affliction, grief can be visited with myriads of temptations to refuse Christ's comfort through his people. Are you willing to say, Jesus, don't comfort me through that? Or do you say, I lack, and Lord, comfort me in any way you choose. We may, we, we may want comfort on our own terms, turning into bitterness toward the church rather than loved. This moved Paul to send Timothy in the first place because he wanted to encourage this church through that affliction. Thanksgiving to God for his comfort and care for us in this local church, leaves no room for grumbling or bitterness. None whatsoever. You have no excuse to grumble. In our lack, our loving Savior provides his supply through his church. So Paul, who sent Timothy to encourage this church, now Timothy returns with what? Good news. And Paul is encouraged. So you can put it, mutual encouragement. That's, that's the church. No matter how tired or frustrated a pastor can get, believe me, when we see our children walking in the light, we are strengthened, we are renewed. I can tell you that. That's what 1 John's all. Ugh, I cannot tell you what joy I have to see that you are walking in the light. And the face-to-face fellowship they each long for, they trust will be supplied, whatever is lacking in their faith. So could we really say, 
Oh, no, Jesus, I have all the faith I need. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I have all the love within my heart that I could possibly need. Please don't send me any more people to love. Please don't send me any more people to be loved by. In fact, I'll give you a list of people and their characteristics that I will tell you who I will love, and I will tell you who I will have fellowship with. Tell me how then you think that's going to end. Christ the sovereign who's put us together for his glory. Of course it's work. <laughs> of course it is. And then he supplies to you what they need. And get this, this is the joy of this, the beauty of this. What you lack, you get from them. And that's Christ at work in us. That's how he does. That's how he forms his church. One last thing. It's in Hebrews 10. And I know some of you know me really well. This is where we're going. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir one another up to what? It's just two things weren't listed here. Stir one another up to what? Stir one another to rally for some sort of cause out there? No. What is the church to be stirring one another to do? Love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some. But here's that word again. But encouraging one another and all the more, increasingly, as we see the day drawing near. What is he saying? This is a warm invitation to you. Dear lacking Christian. Do not neglect face-to-face -face fellowship of this church. Christ means for you to be a part of it for your good and his glory. We gather to stir one another up for works that are pleasing to him and for our mutual encouragement. You need encouragement in the faith. You need encouragement in the love of Christ. You need an increase in the love of his church. You need him. And you need his church. When the Holy Spirit changes your heart, your heart longs for Christ and his people who gather to worship him. That's the longing of Paul. That's the longing of the Thessalonian church. We come when we can see each other. We do it joyfully. We come as forgiven. And if the great apostle Paul required encouragement of a little church, face-to-face -face brotherhood, then so do you and so do I. And our Savior is so good to supply what we lack through one another. And we encourage one another, as the Hebrews says, for the day of his return is drawing near. This is the theme of 1 Thessalonians too. Remember, they're questioning, is Jesus coming back? Yes. How? Well, I'll give you a little bit of that information. <laughs> you know, he's coming back for us. There are days that I long for the day of Christ's return more strongly than others. I think today's one of those. Especially, it's like, this is a foretaste, right? It's a foretaste when we gather on Sunday worship of what is coming ahead. We are reminding one another through the afflictions and the heartache of this world, longing for that day. He who has not abandoned us to be orphans but sends us his Holy Spirit to encourage us heavenward. He is returning for us. We declare his death until he comes, is why we commemorate the Lord's Supper. But our loving Savior returns to us more than sin the thief has stolen away. Can you believe that day is coming? Heartache after heartache, affliction after affliction, we encourage one another with these words. No matter what has been stolen from you, and no matter how much the tempter comes alongside of you, Christ is returning to us far more abundantly than anything has been taken away. You know, it's the end of Job. What you're getting at the end of this time is more than Job retur was returned for. More joy. Even if sorrow may tarry for the night, there's more peace. Even if the world or our little lives here seems chaotic and riddled with anxieties and burdens, beloved, 
Christ, the mighty burden carrier, is ours now. And he sovereignly gathered his church and commanded her, carry one another's burdens. Where do we get the strength to do that? By being in the Lord. Oh, and there is love. Steadfast love. A love which fuels his church to love one another with. God is good to open our eyes in the depths of our heart of our need for his salvation. And he reveals to us our need and Christ who is our full supply received by faith alone. So I close by asking you, do you need anything? And I mean anything. You're so well, nothing that you can provide, Pastor. I know that. Oh, good news. Look to Christ. If you have not trusted him, I urge you to turn from sin and all of its empty promises to Christ. His promises are true and they're everlasting. To the glory of the Father. Amen. Let us pray.